from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. I'm Ann McLean from the Library's Music Division. Thank you so much for coming. This is a great audience. We're very pleased tonight to present a lecture by Marie Rolfe, Debussy's fascination with the exotic from China to Spain. Dr. Rolfe is Senior Associate Dean of Graduate Studies and Professor of Music Theory at the Eastman School of Music. As a scholar, her research interests and publications range from analysis and performance to the pedagogy of music theory and the music and manuscripts of Debussy and Mozart. Throughout her career, Dr. Rolfe has been noted for her scholarly examinations of the music of Claude Debussy through, his explora through her explorations of his manuscripts, beginning as early as her graduate studies at Eastman. Here at the Library of Congress, I'm very glad to say that she has studied a number of our sources, and she'll be talking about that tonight. She's the editor of the critical edition of Debussy's La Mer, and has also published his Segadilla with the composer's publisher, Durand. Currently, she's editing a volume of his early songs to be included in his complete works. At the Eastman School, in her work as dean, Dr. Rolfe has initiated and developed a number of new diploma and certificate programs. Among these are or or orchestral studies, ethnomusicology, and sacred music. It's really a pleasure to have her here as a lecturer under the auspices of the library's music division. Please welcome Dr. Marie Rolfe. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you all for being here. I'm grateful to the Library of Congress for your kind invitation for me to speak about one of my very favorite composers, Claude Debussy, and specifically about two songs, uh, one of the manuscripts of which is on the table to my right, and the other w is in a microfilm here at the Library of Congress. It is my hope that during the next hour, you'll come to share my excitement and enthusiasm in discovering and hearing uh, these largely unknown works uh, by this marvelous composer. So here we go, Debussy's fascination with the exotic from China to Spain. Throughout his life, Claude Debussy was captivated by exoticism, which essentially involves the notion of a fascinating other world that is tantalizingly different from one's native culture. Some of Debussy's best loved compositions, works like Pagode from his Estampe for Piano and Iberia from the Orchestral Image, conjure up landscapes of faraway places from the Orient to Spain. As a cosmopolitan and relatively well-traveled Parisian, he was exposed to the traditions, sights, and sounds of other cultures. In addition, many of Debussy's closest friends opened his eyes vicariously to the art and aesthetic values of other civilizations. Among them were Edmond Bailly, whose bookshop, the Librairie de l'Art Indépendant, was a hotbed for Orientalism and esotericism, Pierre-Louis and Paul-Jean Toulet, whose extravagant travels ranged from Egypt and Algeria to Tonkin, and Louis Lalois and Victor Segalin, whose work took them to the Far East. And as Edward Said has reminded us, Paris was, quote, the capital of the Orientalist world, quote, by the turn of the century when Debussy was in his prime. In my presentation today, I aim to demonstrate how Debussy absorbed those influences, and perhaps most importantly, how they served as a catalyst in the process of his own compositional growth. To that end, I will highlight two of his songs in particular, the Rondelle Chinois and Segadilla, 
treasures whose manuscripts are preserved in the music division here at the Library of Congress and that were never published during Debussy's lifetime. In fact, the Rondelle Chinois finally appeared only in 2013, edited privately by Nigel Foster for the London Song Festival, and Segadia was released by Durand, Debussy's own publisher, in a score edited by yours truly in August 2014. The manuscript of the Rondelle Chinois has been housed at the Library of Congress since 1930, when it was purchased from uh, Henri Prunier by Carl Engel, and the manuscript of Segadia is currently in a private collection whose owner has graciously shared a microfilm of it with the music division. Debussy was still a teenager when he composed the Rondelle Chinois. While he had not yet had personal encounters with Eastern music, he could not have escaped the craze in Paris during his formative years for art of the Orient. Following the opening of trade channels between the East and West in the mid-19th century, the European market was flooded with articles such as prints, ceramics, furniture, ivories, silk, and bronze works from China and Japan. Dealers like Siegfried Bing began to import Orientalist objects in the 1870s. From 1888 till 91, he published a monthly journal called Le Japon Artistique. And by 1895, he opened a shop called La Nouveau in the 9th arrondissement. If you look over the doorway there, you can see the words La Nouveau. Um, this is uh, slightly later architecture, but an example of architecture from the 1860s that was conceived in Oriental style is the Bataclan Theater. Originally a cafe concert, but which has been in the news this past weekend, as you know, for very sad reasons, as the site of a devastating terrorist attack. And the uh, black and white photo on the left is a photo from around 1900. It, the theater opened in 1865, but it still has its original pagoda uh, roof and is very Orientalist style. And the, the color photo on the bottom right is uh, from 2008, when it has just recently been, uh, had recently been painted. Other individuals, like Enrico Cernucci, a patriot who fled Italy after the 1848 revolution and relocated to Paris, where he would become a wealthy banker, collected Oriental art on a massive scale. Disheartened by the Paris Commune of 1871, Cernucci decided to escape the turmoil in his adopted city and traveled around the world from 1871 to 73, during which time he purchased approximately 5,000 artworks, many of them Chinese bronzes. Upon returning to Paris, he displayed them at the Palace of Industry, contributing to the emergence of Japonisme in France. Today, one can still view his fabulous art collection at his former home, now the Musée Charnouchy, in the Parc Monceau. Artists in Europe embraced exotic elements from the East, celebrating its linear qualities and lavish colors in their canvases. As early as 1875, Claude Monet memorialized his wife in kimono dress in this flamboyant painting now preserved at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. There she is. <laughs> In 1886-7, to seven, Vincent van Gogh portrayed Le Père Tanguy three times, the third of which most unabashedly reflects Orientalism. That same year, van Gogh quite literally copied two prints by the J great Japanese ukiyo-e artist Hiroshiga. The first is The Flowering Plum Tree, that's Hiroshiga's woodblock from 1857, and here, is Van Gogh's copy from 1887. Also, Hiroshiga's Bridge in the Rain, I love that rain coming down diagonally, 
uh, from 1857 and Van Gogh's copy 20 years later. Even James McNeil Whistler, so well known for his monochromatic portraits and watery nocturnes, could not resist the lure of the East. In 1863, he began painting The Princess from the Land of Porcelain, which eventually was incorporated into the Peacock Room, now in the Freer Gallery here in Washington, DC. The Japanese screen in the background may have belonged to Whistler himself, who passionately collected oriental objects, including china, lacquerware, and Japanese woodblock prints. And here she is in situ in the uh, peacock room with many of those ceramics along the wall. The contemporary musicians and writers in France were not immune to this pervasive influence of exoticism. In the decade between 1875, when Bizet's Carmen was premiered in Paris, and 1885, when Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado opened in London, French stage works were teeming with exotic subjects from Delibes' Lacme to Massenet's Le Roi de Lahore and Le Cid. The Goncourt brothers were actively chronicling Parisian art and society, including the rage for Orientalism. They avidly followed Chernouchi and began themselves to collect Japanese prints and Chinese porcelain, displaying these objects in their home amidst their 18th century French treasures, often commenting on the resonances between the arts of the East and West. Later, in the 1890s, Edmond de Goncourt published on the works of Hokusai and Utamaro, whom he called the Watteau of Japan. It's no wonder that Debussy, who was coming of age in this exotically saturated milieu, was swept up in the current. He too venerated the work of Hokusai and Utamaro. As shown in this famous photograph of the composer with his guest Igor Stravinsky, taken in his study decades later. On the wall behind the composers, at the top, hangs Hokusai's Great Wave off Kanagawa, which Debussy requested for the cover of the first edition of his orchestral masterpiece, La Mer. Hokusai's on the left, cover of La Mer on the right. And beneath it is Utamaro's portrait of Wakatsuro as she reads a letter, echoing the second scene in Act I of Pelias et Melisande, where Genevieve reads Golo's letter aloud to the blind King Arkel. On Debussy's desk is his beloved and ever-present wooden toad from Japan, a fetish that the composer named Arkel, who brought him good luck on his travels. Uh, uh, there is a grand dame in WC research who is now deceased. Her name was Margaret Cobb, who uh, used to tell the story about WC traveling, and he would say, Ne mettez pas Arkel dans la, la valise. Il n'aime pas ça. Don't put Arkel in the suitcase. He doesn't like that. <laughs> Debussy, an inveterate smoker, also owned this Japanese lacquered cigarette case and this 19th century lacquer work of gold fish encrusted with mother of pearl. These poissons d'or inspired one of his images for piano in 1907. Even when he could ill afford such objets d'art during his student years, Debussy coveted curios and was known to have spent time and money acquiring them. It is thus perhaps no surprise that he would be attracted to the sensual rondelle chinois, a poem which paints a Chinese tableau. This is a tableau by Hokusai, uh, set on a lake that is bordered with azaleas, water lilies, and bamboo. On the water floats a mahogany junk boat in which a lady sleeps, veiled in a swath of crepe up to her neck, while a mandarin observes her 
with his owl-like eyes from his lacy veranda in the distance. The author of this captivating landscape was unknown until a few years ago when Debussy scholar Denis Erlin was able to identify the poet as Marius Dillard. A critic of literature, art, and music, Dillard eventually became the director of a magazine called Rouen Artiste. While yet in his teens, he had won a poetry contest with his rondelle chinois, and as a result, it was published in the May 5th, 1878 issue of the Union Littéraire des Poètes et des Prosateurs. Debussy, two years younger than Dillard, chose to set the text of the Rondelle Chinois as a song for Madame Marie Vanier, a coloratura soprano whom he accompanied as a student and who would inspire no fewer than 29 of his early melodies. Young Achille, which was his given name, was besotted by this married older woman, and she in turn must have been flattered by his attention. Before long, they became deeply involved. The flowery dedications to Madame Vanier that Achille penned on his manuscripts bear witness to the intimacy of their relationship. The manuscript of the Rondelle Chinois is no exception. You can see the original on the table. I'm sorry, the uh, copy is not terribly legible. But if you look in the top uh, uh, left corner, he writes, to Madame Vanier, the only person who can sing and make forgettable all that this music has that is unsingable and perplexing. He says, tout ce que cette musique a d'enchantable et de chinois. In French, the, the phrase, pour moi, c'est du chinois, is the equivalent of, it's Greek to me, in English. So, in this dedication, the composer is cleverly punning on the adjective chinois. Following the title of the song, the composer continues with tongue in cheek, identifying the work, uh, the last two lines on uh, this slide, as musique chinoise, D'après des manuscrits du temps, Chinese music based on manuscripts of the period, which was, of course, bogus. It's clearer, even from this title page, that this piece was a calculated attempt to render the allure of the unconventional or exotic in sound. Although this autograph manuscript is not dated, we can infer a date of 1881 for two reasons. First, Young Achille misspelled Marie's last name. Uh, you'll be able to see it on the table there as V-A-N-I-E-R instead of V-A-S-N-I-E-R. It's only by January 1882 that he began to spell Marie's name correctly on manuscripts, so we know this has to be prior to that time. Second, WC biographers report that he accompanied Marie in a recital, which included the Rondelle Chinois in 1881. While unfortunately no program of that event has been preserved, we do have a printed program for a recital in which Marie and Achille performed two of his other songs, Fête Galante and Les Roses, it, they're down um, four from the bottom there, on 12 May 1882. And if you look at the top, about the third line down, you can see he must have discovered how to spell her name correctly by this time since it was printed as V-A-S-N-I-E-R on the program. Dillard's poem is a classic rondelle form in that it consists of 13 lines, two quatrains followed by a quintal, with a two-line refrain that opens the first quatrain and closes the second. In his rondelle chinois, only the first line of the refrain returns after the final quintal, and the challenge for the poet is to find seven compelling rhymes for the A lines and six rhymes for the B lines. Ideally, the poet will also illuminate a new aspect of the original idea each time, rather than simply repeating the refrain for its own sake. In the Rondelle Chinois, Dillard continually shifts the focus of his images, not unlike a videographer. 
In the first strophe, he moves from the general landscape on the lake bordered with azaleas, water lilies, and bamboo to focus on the slight motion of the boat within that scene. A mahogany junk with a gold tapered bow passes by. But in the second strophe, De La reverses orientation, training his lens first on detail, the sleeping Chinese woman who's clothed in crep, and then executing a literary focus pole by situating her within the wide angle landscape of the lake. In the following quintal, he transfers our attention from the crepe dress of the woman in the boat on the water to the lacy veranda of the Mandarin on the shore, who is watching with owl-like eyes, who the Chinese woman who is passing by, where? on the lake bordered with azaleas. So you see that Debussy's continually shifting, de Lau's continually shifting juxtaposition of images creates a sense of fluidity and panoramic vision in spite of the repeated refrains. Each line of a rondelle typically contains eight syllables and de Lau's poem fo follows this principle as well. Sur le lac bordé d'azalé, there's eight, de nénuphar et de bambou, passe une jonque d'acajou à la pointe d'or effilée. Une chinoise d'or voilée d'un flot de crêpes jusqu'au cou, sur le lac bordé d'azalé, de nénuphar et de bambou. While Debussy does not repeat musical material for each of the refrains of the rondelle, circled in this slide, he does respond to its three large divisions by casting his song in a ternary form, A, B, A. Both of the A sections convey the pastoral scene in the tonic or home key of A minor, while the B material centers closely, uh, centered on the closely related key of C major and features a new motive and increased rhythmic motion in the piano. Debussy echoes de Lars' octosyllabic lines in his choice of a duple meter and a regular two and four bar phrase structure. In the A sections, the piano conveys the sensation of a boat gliding gently on the water. The languid duple pulse emphasized by hollow open fifth pedals in the bass on the downbeats contrast with dissonances on the second part of each measure, simulating a steady ebb and flow of the water. Against this plaque placid black backdrop, as you just heard, Debussy lavishes ornamental interest in the vocal line, which is clearly designed to suggest a mysterious other, a foreign fragrance of the East. This melody is replete with pentatonic inflections, a non-Western pitch organization that are overlaid on a similarly exotic modal quasi-Dorian canvas. Whether the voice is that of the lady in the boat or that of a narrator, we hear her before we meet her as Debussy opens his song with a captivating vocalese. Of course, in a practical sense, passages such as this were composed to show off Madame Vanier's high and agile voice. In Debussy's Rondelle Chinois, they also serve a structural function, introducing the A section and uh, as well as the retransition to the final A and then uh, ending the song. Let's now hear at least the A and B sections of uh, this entire song performed by Nathalie Desay and Philippe Cassard. Uh, I will um, I'll perhaps overdub where we are uh, because they are very metrically free here. Uh, it may be hard for you to follow the phraseology. Uh, and then a return of A. Just as Van Gogh was copying Hiroshiga's Bridge in the Rain, so was Debussy imitating what he knew of Chinese musical conventions in his setting of the Rondelle Chinois. 
Our knowledge of his precise musical models is scant, but presumably he would have been copying Western imitations of Eastern music at this time in his life, because his first serious exposure to indigenous music of the East would not occur till, until later in 1889 at the Paris World's Fair. And just as Van Gogh would absorb elements of Japanese ukiyo-e into his own artworks, so too did Debussy harness some of the musical ideas that he had developed in imitation of Eastern musics and incorporate them into his own distinctly French works. A clear illustration of this assimilation is found in his song entitled Fête Galante, based on a poem by Théodore de Bonville and composed just one year after the Rondelle Chinois. There is no hint of Orientalism in Bonville's poem. Rather, it evokes the very French genre of the Fête Galante, depicting elegantly dressed men and women often in a park-like setting, and engaging in amorous play a la Watteau. This is his famous L'embarquement pour six terres. Debussy would soon turn to Verlaine's collection of Fête Galante, setting eight of the 22 poems to music, but in a sense he apprenticed in the genre by setting Bonville's poem first. In Debussy's Fête Galante song, which the composer himself described as Louis XIV music with formulae from 1882, he reappropriated melodic embellishments from the rondelle chinois. Already in the opening gesture, he composed a melody with the same characteristic turns, outlining the open fifth in blue and emphasizing the flat three and flat six scale degrees in red and green. And the primary difference being that the Fête Galante tune is now in triple meter, you see the three four there, instead of the duple meter of the rondelle chinois. The second phrase in both songs moves up to the high A and exhibits the same Dorian inflected F sharp within the melisma. I've adjusted the spacing in the notation of this example to juxtapose visually the similar outlines and have bracketed parallel pitch material in the same color, but you'll be able to hear this immediately. Debussy's approach to the final cadence shows further resonances between the two songs, ending with an extended vocalise that ascends stepwise to the high A. Possessed with perfect pitch, the composer would surely have been conscious of these direct melodic connections. Likewise, his tonal plan, though more complex in the later Fête Galante song, shows a similar opening move from the tonic of A minor to C, and the phraseology remains very square. Because he's no longer attempting to evoke the Orient, Debussy limits his use of pentatonicism and a drone bass in the Fête Galante, but he maintains the melismatic pitch material that he developed in the Rondelle Chinois, even at the same pitch level as we have seen, and he retains the modal inflections and the vocalises as well, beginning and end. In an even more extreme act of self-borrowing, he eventually recycled and refashioned the material from his Fête Galante song into the minuet movement of his petite suite for piano four hands. So here's the opening of uh, the song as sung by Anna-Marie Rod and uh, uh, played on piano, the, uh, performed by the late and great Noel Lee. Compare that to uh, Noel Lee and Werner Haas playing uh, the beginning of the menuet from the Petite Suite. The point is, the distinctive pitch elements and melodic treatment that emanated from his engagement with an Oriental subject were eventually assimilated into his own uniquely French compositional vocabulary. Of course, the East was not the only source of foreign and exotic influence for Debussy or other artists of his time. Keenly aware of his environment, he could not fail to have been influenced, as were Bizet, Chabrier, and later Ravel, by France's well-established attraction to all things Spanish. 
Debussy was too young to enjoy the Spanish gallery established at the Louvre from 1838 to 48 by collectors, or perhaps one should more aptly call them plunderers, uh, such as Marshal Sue, who arrived in Spain during the Napoleonic occupation of 1808 to 14 and brought back many treasures to Paris. However, a recently discovered letter suggests that Debussy may have had the opportunity to view some of the Velázquez paintings at the Prado in Madrid prior to his residency at the Villa Medicis as a winner of the Prix de Rome. And he surely would have been exposed to Spanish folk songs and dancing performed in the cafes and on the streets of Paris. Among his very first compositions was Madrid, drawn from Alfred de Musset's Comte d'Espagne et d'Italie. In it, Musset, Musset portrays a seductive and illusion temptress, not unlike Carmen in Bizet's opera. Debussy presumably attended a performance of Carmen in Vienna in November 1882 with his patroness, Madame Nadezhda von Meck, who two years earlier was said to have treated him to a bullfight in San Sebastian while he was staying with her family in Arcachon in southwestern France. As Tchaikovsky's devoted patroness, Madame von Meck was eager to introduce the young Debussy to the Russian composer's music, and she asked him to transcribe, among other things, the Danse Espagnole from Swan Lake for piano for hands. Back in Paris at the Conservatoire, it's highly likely that Debussy would have come to know Carmen well through his composition teacher, Ernest Giro, who constructed the recitatives for Bizet's opera and compiled 12 numbers from it into two orchestral suites in 1882 and 1887. Other Spanish influences on Debussy may have come from faculty and students at the Conservatoire. For instance, his harmony teacher, Emile Durand, had set Théophile Gautier's Segedia already in 1874, which may have prompted Debussy to try his own hand at it. As is the case for the Rondel Chinois, there is only one complete manuscript source for Debussy's Segedia. Although it is not dated, we can surmise based on the paper type used, the layout of the manuscript, and other chirographic evidence that it was completed sometime after the end of March 1883, the year following his composition of Fête Galante. And the cover page for Segedia features the song's title in the center, creatively lettered diagonally down to the right, and followed by Poésie de Théophile Gautier and Musique de H. Debussy, with, of course, the dedication on the top right of the page to Madame Vanier. Debussy's signature on the last page of this Segadia score is quite similar to his signature for Invocation from May 1883, as well as that on the fly leaf of the Recueil Vanier, a collection of 13 songs which Debussy finished by February 84 and which he presented to Marie Vanier sometime before leaving for Rome. The most intriguing clue in our quest to ascribe a date of composition for Segedia comes from a phantom page in the Recueil Vanier. It follows the sixth song in the collection Coquetterie Posthume, which was also based on a Gautier text and dated at the bottom there, it's very hard to see, but it's 31 Mar Mars, March 83. The folio after the end of the Coquetterie Posthume song was mysteriously excised from the volume. However, ink blots bled from the folio that was removed onto the remaining page. And if one reverses the image of the ink blots, reading backwards from right to left, the outlines of the accompanimental figuration, as well as the descending arabesque-like triplets of the vocal line of Segedia are clearly exposed. Maybe not so clear on these slides. Not even that clear in reality. You need a, a loop. Uh, what do you call that? Thank you. <laughs> uh, to, to see it well. 
Including the folio that was excised, 11 consecutive pages were left blank in the Recueil Vanier, approximately the number needed for a title page and the planned notation of the entire Song of Segedia. So clearly, Debussy was already working on Segedia during the first half of 1883, after the Coquetterie Posthume. The female character in Gautier's poem is decidedly different from the elegant Chinese woman in Di Lao's Rondel Chinois. Having spent a great deal of time in Spain, Gautier was seeking to portray a Manola, a characteristically bohemian and flirtatious woman of strong temperament and in flamboyant dress. In his book, Voyage en Espagne, he wrote of his exhaustive search for a pure-blooded Manola while in Spain, and we might imagine her as similar to the earthy depiction of Francisco de Goya's Una Manola, shown here, or perhaps more like the seductive dancer in John Singer Sargent's El Haleo, uh, painted in 1882. It's just right in the same time period. That you can see at the uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. In any case, the Manola in Segedia wears a tight skirt and huge comb in her chignon. Her gestures are bold and carefree with no thought for the morrow, and she sings and dances to the sound of castanets dallying with the toreadors while smoking cigarettes. The structure of Gautier's poem follows, follows the general outline of a traditional poetic seguidilla, which consists of a four-line copla or quatrain, followed by a three-line estrabillo or tercet that serves as a refrain. In classic segedias, each copla alternates lines of seven and five syllables with a rhyme scheme of ABAB, and each estrabillo reverses the pattern with lines of five, seven, five syllables and a rhyme scheme of CDC. Furthermore, all of the five syllable lines typically feature assonance. While these details vary somewhat in Gautier's Segedia, the basic structure remains, and he concludes with the estrabillo refrain that celebrates the lively Manola. Alza, hola. Voila la véritable Manola. Debussy celebrated her as well, up to high C sharp. Not only does the song exude the Manola's overt flamboyance, but its abrupt conclusion reflects the bien parado of a typical seguidilla dance in which the performers freeze in their final position. As you can see in the next slide, Debussy's form, musical form, parallels Gautier's poetic structure. His extended 46-bar introduction, featuring the Manola's vocalese, is followed by strophe one, or copla one, in A minor, with its virtuosic refrain, the estrabillo in tonic major. Strophe two is cast in the relative major of C. These, do you remember these keys? <laughs> And a coloratura cadenza leads to the return of A for strophe three, which ends with a bien parado on a high C-sharp and tonic major. This formal and tonal plan, as well as the prominent vocalises, were all seen in the Rondel Chinois from two years earlier. However, just as Debussy captured the flavor of Eastern musics in his Rondel Chinois, so did he openly adopt Spanish musical formulae in Segedia. In fact, many of the musical cliches in his song closely resemble conventions found in the most popular Spanish spectacle of the day, none other than Bizet's Carmen. I could focus an entire lecture on the parallels between Bizet's opera and Debussy's song, but will limit myself to just a few of their characteristic features. One of the most obvious is the similarly abrupt and dramatic ending of Carmen's own Segedia from act one of the opera. You all know this. Um, this is thanks to Marilyn Horn that we're hearing it. 
Indeed, Debussy picked up on numerous other Spanish formula from Bizet's Seguidilla, many of which are also present in his Habanera and Chanson Bohème. However, Debussy's song echoes perhaps most persuasively the entre-acte linking acts three and four of Carmen. Both works feature a quick triple meter, slow harmonic rhythm, and chromatic inflections, especially on flat six and flat two. This is the opening of the entre-acte. Above this foundation, Bizet introduces a descending line related to Carmen's earlier habanera, the yum bum ba 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 dum bum bum, you know, that uh, descending line, but now more languid and syncopated, and then contrasts it with a florid ascending melody. Ultimately, this passage gives way to trills and scalar runs. Debussy's song features similar runs in the cadenza after the middle B section. And Carmen's triplet inflected melody becomes even more death defying in Debussy's score. As well, at the climax of the entr'acte, Bizet exposes a descending tetrachord in the bass, sometimes called an Andalusian or Spanish tetrachord. Again, Debussy exploits this cliche fully in his setting of Segadilla. <laughs> However, Debussy's opening tetrachord descends to a tritone away. You see the circled red notes E, D, C, B to B flat, which ultimately functions as a Phrygian flat two in A minor. Above this surprising twist of the bass to B flat, the voice enters on E, the tritone above with a flamboyant trill, and continues with that descending syncopated line that's uncannily reminiscent of the tune in Bizet's entr'acte. Finally, Bizet is fond of overlapping his melodies above four bar ostinato units in the accompaniment. I've circled the four bar foundation in blue here and shown the melody in red, how it overlaps those four bar units. Debussy picks up on this notion of non-synchronous phrase structure already in his vocal introduction with a five bar phrase that overlaps the four bar pattern established in the piano. Similarly, the opening of the first copla contains a five bar vocal entry over regular four bar phrases in the piano. Let's now hear this marvelous song composed by the 21 year old Achille Claude Debussy. Uh, I'm going to play the A section with the refrain. Let's do the B section, Gesta Ardi, and then there's this extended cadenza instead of the refrain, and I think I'll stop it after that. Debussy's sequel to Segadilla was a chanson espagnole that he substituted in the Recueil Vanier in place of his momentarily aborted Segadilla. Ultimately, he codified his Spanish musical style in the chanson espagnole, a duet intended for Marie Vanier to sing with her teacher, Madame Moro Santi, and that showcased their virtuosity. Based on a text by Alfred de Musset, whose Madrid Debussy had set as a rather unimaginative strophic song several years earlier, the Chanson Espagnole had been popularized by Delibes and others as Les Filles de Cadix. It would become Debussy's third song about a bullfight, the story told this time from the perspective of the Toreador, who's flirting with girls near the bullring. In the Chanson Espagnole, Debussy pulled together the bolero rhythm that he had used in Madrid and that Bizet had used in his entr'acte, yum pum 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 yum pum 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 with the other Spanish conventions that we've already heard, triple meter, a slow harmonic rhythm, chromatic and modal inflections, especially on flat six and flat two, virtuosic octave leaps, runs and trills in the voice, triplet inflected descending melodic motives and a descending Andalusian tetrachord in the bass. 
Perhaps most memorably, he highlighted the dual soprano's elaborate vocalises at the beginning of the song and in the refrains, as you can see uh, the bottom line, Les Filles de Cadix, following each of the two strophes, as he had in the Segadilla, and he finished with an abrupt bien parado, just as he had concluded the Segadilla. And the piece ends with that, just the high B, uh, with the bien parado. As he matured, Debussy continued to expand and refine his Spanish musical vocabulary, especially as he intersected with Spanish composers such as Albanius, Manuel de Falla, and Enrique Granados, and the pianist Ricardo Vignes, who would premiere the Spanish-inspired Soiree d'en Grenade from Debussy's Estampe in 1904, as well as La Serenade Interrompue from the first book of Preludes in 1911. Debussy's later full assimilation of Spanish elements into his own compositional vocabulary is evident in works such as Iberia and other piano preludes. These works reflect his continued exposure to and exploration of indigenous Spanish folk songs as they were disseminated in anthologies published by individuals such as Philippe Pedrel and others. And of course, he absorbed many other Orientalist sights and sounds through the Paris World Fairs. During his formative years as a composer in the early 1880s, Debussy's initial attraction to Orientalist philosophies and values may have triggered his attempts to compose transculturally, that is, to imitate and adopt the stylistic and formal conventions of another culture. But ultimately, he absorbed and generalized these exotic elements within his own musical vocabulary, fully integrating them as he developed his unique compositional voice. Perhaps that is why his music is so universally loved and admired by people throughout the world. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one or two questions, if you have we any. Have yeah. OK, great. Sir. Uh, firstly, I apologize that I was late the first few minutes because of the traffic. I would like to bring up uh, people's attention on the painting. The characters is Han Chi. Chinese characters indicate that Okinawa's H landscape. Yes, it but is from Kenji. It's, it is Hokusai's from Kenji. Uh, there are eight views, yes. O Okinawa. It is. Yes. How, however, I would like to bring up attention that the choice of the color and the spacing pattern of the painting could be more Japanese than Chinese, ah. but under the influence of Chinese inkbrush. Thank you. It, <laughs> Nancy? Okay. Could you elaborate more on the personal relationship between Debussy and Bizet. Uh, in, 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 there's so much um, similarity. Was it friendly or was it competitive in the way they were interacting? You know, Bizet died, uh, in fact, when uh, Giro. Oh, of course, because Bizet died in 75. Yes, yes. So, so Debussy would have known uh, Bizet mainly through his composition teacher, of course, Ernest yes. Giro, uh, with whom he began to study in 1880. And it was in 82 that Giro composed the recitatives for Carmen posthumously, uh, that is, uh, 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 posthumous for Bizet. Uh, the, when Bizet died, the recitatives had not been Henry, composed yet. OK, thank you. Yeah.
Well, I imagine you're all dying to see the Rondel Chinois over there <laughs> and, and look to see the way he misspelled Madame Vanier's name. Um, we have, uh, I believe, the Nocturne, the Orchestral Nocturne, uh, which are dedicated to another lady in his life, uh, Lily, who was his first wife. You'll see uh, this dedication is to my dear Lily Lilo. Uh, we have the Rondel Chinois, we have Apparition, which was based on a Mallarmé poem he composed in 1884, just shortly after these other works we, we've been looking at today. And then there's some Chausson, some Franck, uh, what else, David? And Robert Ravel, Chanson Madecas, yes. Of course, none of these songs were ever published during his lifetime, and they are all so high and so difficult to sing. They really were written for Marie, for Madame Vanier. And once their relationship was over, which happened probably 1887, uh, Monsieur figured out what was going on, and that was sort of the end. Debussy came back from Rome, and it was over. Uh, but he he realized that he, he if he wanted anybody to sing these, he couldn't uh, uh, write such high tessitura and such difficult uh, coloratura. So, uh, and that be, even more importantly, he became very attracted and drawn to symbolist literature, which is very understated, and it's all about implication. It's not hard on the sleeve. It's, it's all uh, more inner. Uh, and um, because of that aesthetic shift in his thinking, he would never have composed a piece like this. So even after, April of 1902, when Pelias was premiered and became incredibly uh, uh, popular. I mean, it just catapulted him to fame overnight. Uh, the publishers were asking for more works, and he, he couldn't possibly keep up with the demand. So he often went into his old you know, portfolios and what can I resurrect and slightly tweak and publish. But he still chose not to do these. And I think it was for aesthetic reasons. Great, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we do have to run out of, uh, well, we have a limit on how long we can be in the building. So we'd love to get you over to the manuscripts. And if you have any further questions for the speaker, feel free to see her privately over there. Right. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.